Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I want to thank you all who take the time to listen. I'm asking for your help now. I'm interested in topics you'd like to hear, people you suggest I interview, or any other recommendations. You can contact me by emailing all feedback to podcast at findthelions.com. That's F-I-N-D-T-H-E-L-I-O-N-S dot com. Also, I want to talk about reviews. On iTunes, reviews matter. So if you appreciate the podcast and you haven't already, please leave a review on iTunes. Positive reviews make the podcast more visible to others. And finally, I provide links to the subjects mentioned in this episode and a link to the transcribed audio in the show notes of your device. As many of you know, we interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, legal consultants, and I believe general counsel soon to come. You are listening to episode number six of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Enjoy a front row seat with law firm leaders, their partners, and legal consultants as we discuss life and leadership. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Kim Johnson of Quarles and Brady. Kim presides over the firm's executive committee and became chairperson in 2013. She received her JD from the University of Florida, Levin College of Law, and her LLM in taxation from the University of Miami. She's been practicing trust in estate law for more than 30 years and continues to. Accolades that follow her is the Florida Achievement Award from the Florida Commission on the Status of Women, Top 50 Women Florida Super Lawyers, Florida Trend Magazine's Florida Legal Elite, and named several years for five-star best-in-client satisfaction with Wealth Manager. And finally, Kim, you were the eighth named female to lead an AmLaw 200 law firm in the United States. Welcome, Kim, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm delighted to have you as our guest. Thank you, Chris. I'm honored to be with you. Kim, so when we were, before we started recording, we were talking about some things that I'm quite interested to learn more as you feel comfort, but it's, you know, let's talk about your yearly executive committee retreat that you had and the hot issues that were discussed that you guys are focusing on in 2017. What was that number one issue? Before the retreat, I asked my executive committee to make a list of the issues, and then we voted on them. And the number one issue that the firm was interested in is growth for this fiscal year. And with growth, I mean, it's, it seems like that's everyone's number one issue. How did you guys conclude on the retreat what that might look like? Or I imagine it's not just a one-year focus, but it probably is a multi-year focus. We decided to take a deeper dive in growth. Uh, we're going to do some analysis, some other research, and get back together in July and with some recommendations. So growth is where should we be in the market? Are we in the right space? Growth is, do we need to add different niche areas, different practice areas? Um, Are we in the right cities, the right location? Does that make a difference? So growth encompasses many different aspects. So it's not necessarily growth for growth sake, but it's very strategic and where to, I guess, allocate time and resources. You mentioned another topic that came up, which I really appreciated, which is how do you work better together? Can you tell me about that? We hired a psychologist a recovering attorney, Dr. Larry Richard, and he came the first day. And and prior to meeting together, he administered the caliper test to all the executive committee and our four chiefs, the head of HR, IT, our CFO, and our uh, client relations, business development, marketing person. So to better understand our personality traits, so we all agreed to share those personality traits so that we would understand each other better and how we communicate with each other. Also going forward in the future as we're establishing subcommittees to try to make sure we have personalities that work together. So we want diversity of thought. That's very important, but we want to understand how we best communicate. I'd love to be a bug on the wall on that. I mean, that'd be fascinating to have a bunch of lawyers talk about their personalities and how they relate. Was that fun? Was it awkward? Was it revealing? There was more laughter Uh, the first day than there was the second day. People, (laughs) lawyers tend to be outliers. So, and we talked about those outlying personality traits. You know, lawyers are known as being very independent, very skeptical. Um, And it was just interesting to see uh, different people in the room that you may have thought they were one way and actually, you know, they 
in under the 18 trace they ranked differently. Uh, but I think everybody was skeptical going in, obviously their lawyers, going into the meeting, but I think everybody found it to be very interesting. Some people, I guess we all have blind spots, maybe not really understanding our personality. And so that was part of the beauty of it is to understand your own blind spot so that maybe you tone it down in certain situations when it doesn't work for you. So one of the 18 characteristics is urgency. So a lot of the people on the executive committee had a high sense of urgency, which is great as far as getting things done. But if you're constantly urgent, that means you're probably not a very good listener. And there are certain settings as a leader where you want to listen. So if you have that urgency, a very high in your personality trait, you need to learn how to tone it down so that you have the benefit of listening to others. You had brought up another topic that you guys discussed on the retreat, which was future size and shape of the firm. Can you share a little bit about what you guys were considering or how that discussion was going? Well, what is the law firm of the future? What does it need to look like in order to serve our clients? Do we need more staff attorneys to make sure that each group has some succession planning? So as the baby boomers retire, we have the right people behind them. Do we need more part-time attorneys? Do we need more paralegals, more patent agents? You know, what should we look like to best serve our clients? It's a very changing legal market. And I think we've been doing a fairly good job on the succession planning. We've asked each partner in the firm to actually do a succession plan so that we make sure there's someone behind them and that the client understands the bench strength so that they're not just being served by partner A, but they understand that partner A has a team. Yeah, you know, succession planning is such a huge issue. Continue to deal with the class of aging partners who may not want to retire or hand over their clients. I mean, does your firm have mandatory retirement? We do. Okay. It's at 66, and then with the permission of the executive committee, you can stay until you're 70. Okay. Is it assumed that those clients become institutional at that point when they transition to the firm? Are they already in- institutional? It's That process seems fascinating with some firms that have eat what you kill compensation and cultures. Yeah, and we are definitely not an eat what you kill. So I would say for the larger clients, the first couple of years after somebody transitions, it stays a firm client, and then it transitions to the person that's really uh, assuming the responsibilities for the client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that that sounds fair, and it sounds like on a case-by-case basis. Well, I think it's something that we try to work out ahead of time. We, you know, okay. we spend time with the, the partner as they're getting ready to retire. We talk about the team. We make sure that they are transitioning. We make sure that the client feels comfortable. You know, sometimes we think the perfect, what we refer to as CRL, or the person responsible for the client, would be, X and the client says, you know, I would really rather work with A. Mm. So what the client thinks obviously matters. Yeah, I would assume. And I think it's very smart and intentional of you guys to be pulling the client in those conversations versus assumption. It seems like a lot of, it's been known that a lot of firms just kind of assume what the client wants and needs and makes those decisions without pulling them into conversations. Right. I mean, sometimes from our side, it looks obvious, oh, they they really want to work with, you know, partner X. But when you sit down and talk to them, that's not always the case. Yeah. We do a lot of, we hire BTI, which is a third-party vendor, to interview our clients. And I also do chair visits of the, of, for our clients. And that's one of the things we're trying to find out is from the client, what do you want? What do you like? What do you think our strengths are? What are our weaknesses? What are the best practices you see with other firms? And how can we improve? You get a lot of information that way, sometimes surprising information, good and bad. Yeah. How long have you guys been doing that with BTI? I think we originally started in 2011, and then we've made it more regular practice since the last, I think, three years or so. Have the clients appreciated that process? A lot of them do, yes. Some of them resent the time, although it's really not that much time, but the, the clients that are so busy, but their hair on fire, and they don't want to do it, we obviously don't make them do it. But I think we do find out enough good information that we can then come back and improve and modify our behavior that it ends up being a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that's excellent. I want to move to an interesting meeting that you had described where you had said you brought in a professor and a tech CEOs. Tell me more about what that looked like inside of the partners of your firm. So we had a partner retreat last June in Phoenix, and we brought in a professor and 
we had a panel of three individuals who are doing software, innovative software, and then we also brought in a general counsel. She talked about how she used the software and how artificial intelligence is impacting what she's doing. And it was really created quite a buzz in the firm. People were very excited about it. The professor did an overview of all the different companies that are entering the legal business. But I think you know that our industry um, is basically flat as far as law, law firms spend, but it's actually growing with some of these tech companies and third-party vendors. So it was very interesting, I think, to our partners to understand the innovation that's going on in the industry. So out of that, we decided to form an innovation committee, which one of our partners in Phoenix is heading, and with the thought that we would become more innovative for our clients and more effective and more efficient. Without giving away you know, too much of the secret sauce, what does that look like for a law firm to be innovative and effective and more efficient? I mean, what would that look like? One thing that we're working on and other law firms have done is a decision tree. So if this happens, you do this and kind of go down the tree and you can make that into an app and put it on and give it to the client. Although a lot of the firms that are doing this in Europe are licensing it. I don't think the U.S. firms are doing that, but you provide the app to the client. So if they have an issue in this area, they open the app and it's, you know, a list of questions that this happens to this, you know, the bottom question is call your attorney, but, um, it gives them a lot of benefit in the meantime. It's interesting. And you mentioned that the European firms were licensing. That's another source of revenue, if that's, if I it understand. Is. That. Okay. It is. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't think that would fly in the U.S. Uh, I think there's an expectation that you're partnering with them. and Yeah. And so with the professor and the tech CEOs, what were they challenging you with or what were they discussing that other, say, non-legal entities are doing, maybe in other industries, but what's happening there for firms to emulate? There's some technology that you can buy that you can see how a judge rules in certain situations. Hmm. So if you're doing an RFP for a client, and let's say it's IP litigation, and you know you're going to be in this circuit, the software can tell you where you're most likely going to have uh, these two judges. And these two judges you know, maybe the predominant case has four factors in it, but Judge A uh, really relies on factor four. So if you're going to have a trial in front of him, you really want to emphasize factor four versus uh, the other judge. And the clients really like that because it gives you some inside information. You know, you're more likely to win if you do this. So it's amazing what you can find out with the technology. And I know that artificial intelligence seems to be really the the hot thing. Were they encouraging firms to get into that? The software companies were basically trying to sell their software. And mm-hmm. I will say that we had three there and we're looking into buying two of the of the software because we feel like it'll give you a competitive advantage. Absolutely. And it, when we think of AI or artificial intelligence, I mean, how would that play? I mean, that is that wouldn't necessarily be the decision tree, would it? I mean, how would that work inside of a, the practice of a law firm? So one of the software is related to a due diligence when you're doing a deal. So by certain keywords and scanning of the documents, it can cut the cost of the due diligence down. And that can save the clients hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's, oh, that's a big deal. So that, that goes along with what you were saying as far as efficiency. Correct. Okay, fascinating. I wanted to just give you an opportunity to share a little bit more about Quarles and Beatty's law firm philosophy of culture. Would you take a couple moments and just kind of describe um, what makes you guys unique or how your culture works? I do think we're different than other firms. We've always been much more inclusive. We had the first African-American to chair an AMLAW 200 firm, and then I've followed that. And as you said, I was number eight as far as women chairing a large firm. And I think because we're more inclusive, it creates a very collaborative, team-based environment that I think works well for our clients. We have a new president. We have a whole new administration that's a bit more unorthodox than what we've seen over the numerous decades with our country. What are you anticipating with this new administration for just the, the legal industry, for law firms? And also, I'd love for you to speak into how it might affect trust in the state law. Well, I think with change comes opportunity for businesses, which could produce growth, which will produce more legal work. In the trust and estates area, he has specifically stated he wants to repeal the estate gift tax 
and GST tax. So I think for the very high net worth clients, there will be some opportunities if that happens to create long-term trust to gift into because now you're not going to have any gift consequences to remove those from the system. I mean, if he serves two terms, a lot of those people will still be alive when another president comes in and you never know that the tax may be reenacted. So I think there'll be lots of opportunities in many different areas of the law. Mm -hmm. And I know that he's doing a lot to reduce regulation. I think high regulation is a good, is good business for law firms. Do you see the other side of the coin with less regulation? Well, I guess with less regulation, it would free up other businesses to get started and expand, and there may be opportunities there as well. So mm-hmm. if, they're, if their business is growing, that should create more legal opportunities. Yeah, so for acquisition, M&A, and probably, <laughs> probably more opportunities for litigation. Okay. With this podcast really being directed towards law firm leaders, I wanted to give you the opportunity to share maybe your top piece of advice for future chairmen or chairpersons of law firms. Well, to understand, A, how time-consuming it is, but B, to really be effective, I think you have to spend a lot of time listening not only to the partners, the associates, but your staff, and then determine a variety of different ways to communicate. So that's what we've been doing this past year is trying to communicate in all kinds of different ways so that people hear the message. And what does that look like? I mean, it's we're we're an interesting world of technology, and it seems like there's a gazillion ways to communicate something to somebody. Um, and then you're having dealing with numerous, uh, at least three generations. How, how does that work within your firm to communicate what you're trying to communicate? We do use email, but lots of busy lawyers don't like email. We have an internet site. Some of our constituency doesn't like to go to the internet site. So just really a variety of ways. And we've changed the way we do our partnership meetings. When you're a multi-office law firm, it's very difficult to have a partner meeting with question and answers. The bigger offices tend to dominate. The smaller offices then don't feel like they're involved in the meeting. They feel like they're viewing it. So we've started doing something where we have maybe a 20 or 30 minute program on a certain topic. And then we turn the videos off. We have discussion leaders in the various offices with a prescribed set of the same questions. And then we, they lead a discussion in their individual offices and then report back. So that way we get to hear from the partners about what they want, what's important to them on this certain topic. And that's gone over very well. Hmm. They feel like they're valued and they feel like they're heard. That's excellent. How much time do you spend going around listening? I know you said that's just really key. I, I spend two weeks on the road. Um, I do a lot of the chair visits, meaning I go see our clients, and then I spend time in each individual office. Okay. As a law firm leader, and it seems like most, if not all lawyers, it's just kind of expected to read a lot. What blogs do you find yourself reading as a chairperson? I read Eric Press's blog. Uh, He does a great job, and uh, the BTI one, and then there's a couple other ones that don't come to mind. Mm -hmm. Are you a big news reader? Do you check certain news channels, or are you trying to stay away from those? No, the, the uh, American lawyer, you know, I get three or four a day and I read those to try to understand what's going on in the legal business. Mm-hmm. And then obviously trying to understand what's going on in the economy so that we can position ourselves uh, in, you know, perhaps new areas is something that we do, I do as well. Do you like having paper in your hand or are you big on using tech like an iPad or something like that? No, I, uh, because I travel so much, I, I use my iPad on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As a law firm leader, I know, you know, having summarized information is really helpful. What, what key metrics do you try to keep an eye on to manage the firm? We look at a lot of different metrics. Uh, we're trying to increase the number of clients that pay us more than a million dollars a year. Just because we understand those clients better, we can add more value. We have more attorneys working with them. We also look at revenues per lawyer. I think that's a, a great measurement of how healthy we are as a firm. Obviously, that's a number we want to continue to increase. Obviously, you look at billable hours. Obviously, you look at the financials. Mm -hmm. And Kim, is there any, and you can take a minute to think about this, is there any instances in your life, uh, experiences, stories that you feel you'd like to share that made you who you are today as far as a leader, something that was formative, whether in leadership or as a lawyer um, leading an AMLA 200 firm? I think a lot of the skills I use 
were ones that I learned when I was a young lawyer practicing law, uh, raising three sons. And I know that probably isn't the answer that you expected, but you learn how to balance, how to juggle, how to understand uh, what's really important and what's not, and and really to focus. No, I think being a mother is an incredible, uh, <laughs> uh, very important skill. And I have, I personally have outrageous respect for my wife. Um, so no, I, I think there's a lot of credence that should be given to that. And I appreciate you sharing. So kind of positioning and going into the personal questions I like to ask uh, when I do interviews. Tell me about heroes. You know, who, who are your heroes today? I would say one is a lady that used to work for, for us in our Phoenix office named Nancy Felipe. She ran our diversity program for a number of years, and she was always doing something for somebody else. She started a program that uh, we still do in our Phoenix office and actually some of the other offices as well for lower economic schools where we go in and read to them. Uh, she's raised money for them. But she was just always uh, about other people, always giving back, You're really a wonderful person. So tell me about hobbies. I imagine as a, as a law firm executive that you're very busy, you have a lot to do, but how do you do downtime? How do you rest? I'm an avid reader, although I read less since I've chaired the firm. Um, I'm, I took up golf and I'm a terrible golfer, but I do like to golf. I find that very relaxing. And then we, we scuba dive, but I only get to scuba dive once a year. We try to take one big trip. This year we're going to Palau, which I've been to one other time. And I'm very much looking forward to that. So I've had the opportunity to really dive um, many places all over the world, and our, our oceans are very beautiful. Oh, my goodness. Tell me about some other places you've dived in. Uh, one place that we used to go to on a regular basis was Bonaire, and there you could do shore diving, which is kind of fun, so that you, you know, don't have to be on a boat. The Cayman Islands are pretty. We went to Fiji, which is pretty. Last or Two years ago, we went to Yap to go diving with those large manta rays that have the 12 or 14 foot wingspan, just really beautiful creatures. It's amazing. So I, I have to share my travel ignorance. Bonaire and Yap, where are those places? Yap is a very, very small island, very poor. Bonaire is off of South America. Okay. It's part of the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire. Okay. Very fun. And then this probably will coincide with the last question is, what are some items left on your bucket list? To get my golf score better, that would be terrific. <laughs> um, I don't know that that's ever going to happen unless I take some lessons, but we'll see. Um, I'd like to do, I've been fortunate that I've been to all seven continents, and I, there's a lot of places I'd still like to travel. Yeah. So I think that would be fun. What, what, what other places are must-do before you can't travel anymore? I'd like to go to New Zealand. I've heard really wonderful things about New Zealand from many clients, and so I'd like to do that. Um, I've never been to Ireland, so that's another place I'd like to go. Kim, stealing this question, as I always do on each podcast, from Kai Rizdahl of Marketplace, in five words or less, what is your job? To help our clients. It, that's great. <laughs> you did four. Kim, it's been a pleasure and an honor, and I, I just really thank you for your time. I know the legal community is a better one because of your leadership and your firm, so thank you for your time today. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, everyone, who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or would like to recommend someone to be on the podcast, please email them to me, which is podcast at findthelions.com. If you like this podcast, leave a review. The reviews matter, and the more reviews we get, the more visibility this podcast will receive. Also, please share our podcast with others via email or social media. To share our podcast, listen to more shows, or to read the transcription of this audio, go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.